down here. No, like, like, down here. Hey, got a little, before I start the video, I want to tell you something. I got a P.O. box now. The channel hit 250,000 subscribers. Uh, also, not only that, uh, it's going to be open only until this date. So you have until then to send me anything you want. I'm going to make a big compilation video of me opening up all the fan mail. Also, uh, for a limited time only, there's going to be exclusive art prints that you can get. Uh, there's a, there's a form in the in the comments and the description in, uh, down below uh, if you want to get them. Uh, they're only going to be open for two months until the beginning of January. Yeah, about then. So uh, thank you for 250,000. I hope I hope you guys like this stuff. Um, here's your video. I always thought Littlest Pet Shop was really cute, but sadly my memory of it is very scarce. Obviously, I played with my sister's toys with her. All the Littlest Pet Shop toys was hers, and she had a bunch of pets and some of the play sets, you know, the things we can put it inside. And there was like, sometimes there was a little, uh, what we thought was a pool, but was actually just the bed, but we were dumb, so we didn't care. And I only really have one memory of actually playing with her. And then after that, I don't know what happened. Maybe she just lost interest because my, the rest of my memories was just littlest pet shop toys scattered about the floor of the basement. Who knows? But to my surprise, littlest pet shop fans never went away and are in fact still alive to this day. The history of this franchise goes back way farther than what I would have originally thought. So sit tight and let me tell you what happened to Littlest Pet Shop. Back in the ye olden times of 1992. Becky, look at her butt. There was this little toy company called Kenner. Well, they weren't too small at this point since, you know, they secured a deal with Star Wars toys before the first release of the movie. And then Star Wars became a massive hit, and so Kenner was making bank for a little while there. But besides that, Kenner was making a series of toys you're all familiar with, Littlest Pet Shop, and they were pretty good. They had some opposable parts, and the packaging was really cute, mimicking a window of a shop. Kenner eventually started having annoying corporate issues, like being split off and taken by Tonka, where they tried new things with the toy series. And Tonka was bought up by Hasbro. You know, the company that makes Magic the Gathering and My Little Pony. And they created an animated series to help sell the toys, and it was... unique. It's run by some regular guy who lets people walk all over him, and all the pets are literally tiny, smaller than teacup dogs, and that's saying something. And the writers just didn't seem to care, so as long as it's goofy, it goes. They break the fourth wall, they have a woman drink frog juice for some reason, that goes completely unexplained. It's a wild ride. Like the monkey finding a literal banana planet, fashioning a spaceship, having it break, landing on the planet, and start to eat it, thereby endangering the well-being of the banana planet aliens. And don't forget the Darth Vader reference. The show from 1995 is a bit absurdist with its delivery. It adopts more of the philosophy of keep throwing things at the audience so they don't lose attention. Kind of like YouTube videos with a bunch of jump cuts in order to maintain your guys' you know, attention. But in this sense, it's just really the writing style and not the editing style. So long as it's funny and appropriate for children, it goes. Think of it kind of like Ren and Stimpy, if it was cute and not mentally scarring. Eventually Hasbro just sort of merged Kenner toys into the slowly building monster that is Hasbro today. And Littlest Pet Shop had an awkward period where nothing was really happening during the corporate crap that was going on. But the Littlest Pet Shop brand wasn't actually bad, financially speaking. And so in 2005, they rebooted the toys. And this is the era of LPS that I'm most familiar with. Big eyes, cute designs, and Hasbro just knocked it out of the park with these during the time because everyone I knew wanted them, including myself. And when something sells incredibly well, you diversify the toy line so that it sells more. They made extra big toys, play sets. Okay, well, this one is obvious, but they made Tamagotchi ripoffs to capitalize on budding trends. They made an online game with plush toy tie-ins. 
basically whatever they could, they'd slap LPS on there. And typically when you see a company making this many variations to a toy brand, that means it is being successful. This era of LPS, this LPS, this generation of LPS went through five generations of toys that lasted up until around 2016. And with this era came the 2012 tie-in cartoon aptly named Littlest Pet Shop. Produced by DHX Media, the same company that brought you My Little Pony, brings you a show that isn't as wacky as the Kenner show and has actually some good writing. Oh my god, why is her head so huge? So there's this girl named Blythe, who just moved into the big city and she doesn't know what she's doing. And she stumbles inside the Littlest Pet Shop and finds out she can understand the animals. Wait. Did you just say that you can understand us? Yeah. And even when she tries to tell the shop owner, turns out there isn't some magical ability that's bestowed upon her. She can just talk to animals now without really any explanation. And there's like these two popular girls who are also like a super mean to Blythe because they're like super rich and stuff. Allow me. You are cordially ordered? to join Whitney and Britney Biscuit for, like, lunch. And because Blythe can design new, fashionable clothes for pets, she gets hired to work at the Lilith's Pet Shop. Okay, the monkey is still wacky and does frantic things, but that's kind of just how monkeys are written. And it's just like DHX Media to have the episodes break into song. And it's nice that they do the thing where they don't wear the same outfit every episode, but obviously Britney and Whitney kill it every episode. Yeah, the girls are cute because they told me so, and they pay my wage, so I rap in the show. I drive this limo, I don't go slow, and I don't stop driving till I get to the chateau. When I'm not chauffeuring their overpriced wheels, I fold their laundry and I cook the meals. And since this show is made for a very young audience, it's gotta have lessons for the kiddos because laws are weird. I got so carried away with trying to be like you when I really just needed to work on being me. <laughs> but not even, cause you're already great just the way you are. And out of all the characters, my girl Zoe has to be my favorite. I don't believe we've met. I'm Velvet Paw. Fluffy Velvet Paw. Are you waiting for someone? So this show relies on making a bunch of characters, all of the animal friends, and having them be pretty one-dimensional to exhibit one very relatable trait. One is anxious, one is hyperactive, one's a diva, one's a worrywart, one's a dunce, etc, etc. And this isn't new, we've seen this before. You have every character exhibit one trait to an extreme so that it's more relatable for us as an audience in order to better choose a favorite character for us to want to buy that toy of that character. But the issue with them making these characters so one dimensional and exhibit these traits to an extreme is that they can't really change. So any point for character growth is usually just thrown away by the next episode, if there is any at all. They have to keep the relatability to the audience, and that is more important than character growth. Luckily, since this show in particular is only trying to just entertain an audience and not trying to really develop the characters, it's just for funny entertainment purposes, people don't really care if there's character growth. Unlike My Little Pony, where they tried to appeal to the brony fandom, the older audience, which created a whole slew of problems because they also needed to appeal to two demographics. And so when they were trying to have characters have character growth, they would often just revert back to what they were before because again, they need to make sure they're relatable for the younger audience. And that would upset the bronies because they're like, hey, why does Fluttershy have to have the same character arc like three different times? This show has the same setup as My Little Pony, but doesn't have the problem with the angry, horny, and obsessive fan base. Please watch my video on My Little Pony. I also made one of that show too. I actually really like My Little Pony. You've got to grab your chance to be great when you get it. Just like Albert Einstein became great when he discovered that theory about his relatives. My theory about my relatives is that they're very confused about me being gender non-conforming. I like how the writers for the show realize that the voice actress for Blythe, Ashley Ball, who is also the voice actress for Rainbow Dash, 
and Applejack just realize that they can write Blythe adopting a Southern accent in a certain, in like any episode they want, and it's well within the acting range of Ashley Ball. What are y'all doing sitting around like a bunch of round sitters? I will tell you the whole truth at breakfast. I can definitely say that Blythe using text talk during normal conversations is a very unappealing aspect of her character, but that's really just because I think people who speak in text talk are cringe. Thanks for letting me borrow them. And pee. Oops, that's my dad. Gotta go. TTFN. Blythe, that's wonderful. OMG, it's like a dream come true. <laughs> gotcha. I'll just get a ride with young me. I was JK. Really? TSC. That's so cool. However, Mrs. Twombly, using outdated terminology for her character quirk, is adorable and endearing. Dad sucks. I'm afraid my sister's got the vapors again. I'm sick. Jumping, jiving jalopies. Good idea, Blythe. You check the nooks, I'll check the crannies. Ugh. Oh, sweet sassafras. Yeah, and we could say stuff to you in French. And then you could, you know, tell us what it means. Huh, that's actually a pretty good idea. Ah, chez Paris. Oui, oui, baguette. Omelette du fromage. Qu'est-ce que c'est? À la vache. Et la page volée. Beep, beep, lettuce. The setup for this series is that every episode in between like season finales and season beginnings are all standalone episodes. But for the season endings, they usually have a big thing that happens that supposedly mixes it up and, you know, lasts about two episodes, usually a two-parter, which you never really see just like with My Little Pony. Like how at the end of season one, Blythe leaves the littlest pet shop behind to go to the fashion camp for summer. And because the pets miss her, they cheat the system so they can go see her at camp. Then they make a Coraline reference because they love reminding me of scarring yet incredible childhood movies. They manage to meet up, Blythe admits that she's not having fun at fashion camp, and then everything goes back to normal. Or like when she set up a booth at a fashion expo in season two. So soft, like Sunil's belly. Huh? I ship it. And she wins the expo after almost having it stolen from her. And she gets her picture in a fashion magazine. They actually revisit this fact and have it inspire future episodes, unlike the first season finale. Okay, B plus for Blythe. What did you get, young me? An A minus. My parents say it doesn't matter what grade I get as long as it starts with an A. My parents said it doesn't matter what grade I get. I'm still a failure. Or like how they made a fundraiser for endangered animals. Or for the series finale, they did this. I know it'll sound like I hit my head during the emergency landing, but I can talk to rhinos. And not just rhinos. Any animal! Oh, I know. You know? Talking to pets is just one more wonderful way that you're exactly like your mother. You knew that she could talk to pets too? So, if you suspected I was talking to pets, why didn't you ever say anything? I knew you'd bring it up in your own time. When you were ready. Remember what I said about my little girl growing up? Ah, uh, Daddy! Okay, yeah, that's pretty cute. The 2012 series of My Little Pony was the 2012 series of Littlest Pet Shop was really fun to watch, especially since I already like what DHX Media does. I had a strong feeling I'd like this show all the same, but then something changed. After the absolute success of the 2012 cartoon series, the show stopped due to faltering of the sales of the toys. And so Hasbro needed to take a step back and rework the toy line for a new generation of fans. And they tried this new animated series called Littlest Pet Shop, A World of Our Own. In this show, there's a parallel world purely for animals where they can escape the human world without any time passing. 
Now the whole story is focused on the animals, not bouncing between an A plot with the humans and a B plot with the animals. Now the designs of all the characters are super similar to better reflect the design of the toys. Now in terms of whether or not this show is better or worse, I'd say the 2012 series did a better job with the characters. However, this show is definitely more visually appealing. Her head's so huge! All the jokes are really just pet jokes and puns. And honestly, it is exactly my kind of humor. What dog or cat or rabbit in your life wouldn't want a human lap-shaped bed to sleep on? In a way, they're even better than the real thing because they never stand up. Spot me. Oh, never gets old. Aww. She must be pot squirrel, cause that is nuts. Currently, Hasbro is having the same problem that a lot of toy franchises are having nowadays, where their demographic is split between people around my age, we're 20 to 30 years old, who collect toys for fun, and their target demographic, little kids between ages 6 to 12, who they want to sell toys to. Well, their parents. They want to sell toys to their parents. Whatever, you get what I mean. But the older audience isn't really taking much of a liking to the new direction that Hasbro's going with it, because it isn't tailor-made for them. And since Hasbro is trying to appeal to a new generation and trying to save money because, again, toy sales are faltering for this franchise, they're reusing the models for new playsets. Which isn't new, keep in mind, but for collectors, it's annoying. And the collectors are the older demographic. To the younger fans, it doesn't matter to them, it's a new toy. Hey, cool. I was young and didn't have any money. Any of the toys I got was amazing and magical. I didn't know about this idea of collectability, so I took whatever I could get. Now, this isn't really much of a problem as with other franchises, but it's still a little bit of a problem but I don't think Hasbro's really trying to appeal that strongly to the older generation. I think they're really, really trying to focus on six to 12 year olds. Because this is a franchise of small, adorable toys of animals, the majority of videos you'll see from the community are either one, custom made Littlest Pet Shop toys, which are really cool. I love watching those. It's like with the dolls of Monster High, the just custom made dolls and custom made Littlest Pet Shop. That's cool. That's what I like to see. And there's also the, weird skits where people just pretend to play with them and act out a scene, which I never understood why that became appealing to anyone, but then again, when I was growing up, I didn't really feel the need to share my playtime with anyone, I just played with myself, so maybe I'm just broken. According to Hasbro's annual report, they are currently working to build Littlest Pet Shop. The thing is, the sales recently have been so bad, they don't actually consider it a franchise anymore. In 2012, when it was at its peak, they did. Not anymore. Which is understandable, seeing as in the making of this video, I could not find an actual community online for Littlest Pet Shop. There's some videos, there's like one Reddit community, and other than that, that's it. The discords, next to none, and they aren't really that big. There's only like a couple content creators I found that I actually enjoy the content of. But again, I'm not really the person who you should be asking. I'm in the age range of the, per of the demographic. They don't care about all that much. So yeah, that doesn't really say anything. Sadly, over the last few years, Hasbro's main goal has been to build the Power Rangers toy line because they acquired the rights to it in 2018. The most they really said about Littlest Pet Shop is that they're reinventing it. I mean, heck, for real friends, made them more money than Littlest Pet Shop between 2017 and 2018. And there are no public reports of 2020 and 2021, so just, I don't know, sorry. I can't, I literally can, don't have access to information for that. If you ask me, Littlest Pet Shop didn't just fall by the wayside. What happened is it boomed and it didn't have the resources it needed to foster a good fan base. And fan bases, especially nowadays with toy franchises is incredibly important because Transformers has a big fan base. My Little Pony definitely has a big fan base and heck, Beyblade has a huge fan base. And those three franchises make up a lot of sales for Hasbro. Littlest Pet Shop doesn't have that. So is Littlest Pet Shop dead? No. Is it forgotten? 
a little bit. Is it coming back? It looks like it. But that's everything I have for this video. I have a Patreon if you want stickers and trading cards shipped at the beginning of every single month. Follow me on my social media if you want me to brighten up your timeline. And Hasbro, if you want to do fun influencer stuff, get, hit me up. I mean, my email is right there. Comment down below what your favorite memory of Littlest Pet Shop is for you. Stay beautiful and keep playing. Man, that French segment only reminds me how I pronounced Thomas Roman's name wrong in my other video.